we can start. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think, I think the loudspeaker... Uh, sorry, I have to tell him how to start. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know that this is uh, a difficult time for many of us, and I know there are many events, including one that is going to happen in half an hour outside. Um, but thanks a lot for coming uh, today. Uh, I'll introduce myself briefly, and then I'll introduce our speaker, uh, who's going to give the lecture. Um, so I'm Dina Matar, and I am the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS. It's, you know, you can check it out online um, and check what we do, but this is one of the events that we uh, host annually. Um, and today, of course, is a, a very special and a very sad day. Uh, because it is the day of the 1948 Nakba that befell, befell Palestinians. It marks a dark chapter in Palestinian history where entire communities were uprooted, their lands confiscated, and their rights denied. Today, as we reflect on the aftermath of the Nakba, we are reminded of the enduring plight of the Palestinian refugees uh, across the world. But today we know for sure that the Nakba is not an event that ended and had been buried in history books, but continues in even worse acts of barbarism and savagery by a state that has shown its intent to commit genocide against Palestinians and to erase them. Every year we use this occasion to uncover and reveal and tell stories of dispossession and death, but also of resilience and hope. Today we continue to tell and reveal the magnanimity and the horror of what is happening to Palestinians particularly Palestinians in Gaza. For it is not only genocide, but scholasticide, educide, domicide, and memoricide, different forms of sides uh, to erase Palestinians and to control their lives by um, an Israeli state. Today we remain convinced that Palestine will be free, thanks to our supporters and our students who are encroaching on the politics and the spaces in the metropoles of the West that have been supporting Israel. And they are also helping us tell the story. You know, the encamp encampment is outside there, and we really salute those students. The title of our lecture today is titled, What Does Free Speech Have to Do with Palestine's Liberation? And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Rebecca Ruth Gold, who is um, a distinguished uh, professor of comparative poetics and global politics. Rebecca is, um, has published a, a lot of books, uh, she is, uh, her recent book is Erasing Palestine. I have a copy of it there. Uh, and it's called Erasing Palestine, Free Speech and Palestinian Freedom, which was published in 2023. Um, and we have uh, a special discount for this occasion for those people who would like to buy uh, the book uh, provided by the publisher. Rebecca is also author with um, Malaka Muhammad Ishweq of Prison Hunger Strikes in Palestine, A Strategic Perspective which was published by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict in 2023. Her commentary on the politics of defining anti-Semitism and Middle Eastern politics has been featured in Political Quarterly, Prospect Magazine, Al Jazeera, The Nation, The New Arab, uh, Jacobin, and Middle East Eye. Uh, she is also the primary investigator for the European Research Council funded project, Global Literary Theory. Without further ado, I'll welcome uh, Rebecca to the stage. She's going to speak for uh, 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will have uh, questions and answers. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Dina. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, with all of you, and I'm really grateful that you could make it. Um, I do want to begin by saying that, as mentioned, uh, there's actually a rally happening, I believe, right around the corner uh, near the encampment at 6.30, so I just want to say in advance, anyone who feels moved to join that rally for Palestine on Nakba Day should feel perfectly free to leave, walk out at 6.30. I won't take it in the wrong way, just uh, you're, you're, go with my blessings. Don't don't hesitate. Uh, I won't. In fact, I'll take it as a blessing. So, uh, unlike um, yeah, that that's that's my view on the matter. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm talking about um, in part uh, 
my book, uh, which focuses a lot on uh, the suppression of, of free speech, the weaponization of anti-Semitism in European and North American context. Uh, however, the world has really changed you know, since my book was published in July 2023. So I decided to kind of move backwards in time um, in the sense of beginning with the now and then moving backwards uh, to different spaces. Um, so yes, beginning with Gaza. Um, great, and I'm also going to time myself. Okay. So before beginning this lecture, I want to say a few words about a family that is currently based in Gaza who, and who I've come to know well during the past several months. One member of this family is a mariner who made a career of sailing the oceans of the world before returning to Gaza in 2023. Through him, I came to know his niece, Lou Jane, whose story uh, about being forcibly displaced by an Israeli bulldozer that destroyed the home where she was sheltering, I helped to publish last month in The Nation. I would really encourage anyone who maybe hasn't heard or read his, her story to, to please read it. Um, it's easily accessible, and I think it's an absolutely harrowing and inspiring narrative of uh, what, it, what it was like for her to, to be forcibly displaced uh, by this bulldozer. Uh, and the reason why I dwell on these details in particular in this context is that the history of this family demonstrates the power of education to transform lives, particularly in Palestine. The mariner was born into a refugee camp in Rafa and grew up surrounded by poverty, unsure where his next meal would come from. His father found employment with UNRWA and eventually became a history professor in Libya and then Egypt, where he worked for the Ministry of Social Affairs under Nasser. By educating his children, he ensured a bright future for them as well as for their children. When I told the mariner that I would be giving this lecture on the importance of free speech in the struggle for Palestine, he affirmed this point about the importance of education in his family's life. And I think he was also speaking for all people in Gaza when he said, uh, I quote, universities and schools will always be in our minds and hearts we are firm believers that education is the strongest weapon we can ever have, and we intend to maintain it. This under understanding of education as a tool of resistance is also reflected in the story of his niece, Lou Jane, I quote, quote from there on the slide, uh, who wrote with remarkable clarity given the trauma that she had just endured. And this is a quote from her story at the end of narrating um, how she was almost killed. Um, I don't know if the war will stop while we're still alive, but what matters is that there are many people resisting with what is more important than weapons. Every day a father walks beneath the bombs to feed us. A mother stands against bulldozers and tanks to protect her daughter, knowing that even if she dies, her daughter will live. A grandson carries his grandmother and never thinks of leaving her behind for even an instant. A sister pulls her brother out from under the rubble, away from death, and tries to save him. And those two quotes that I quoted from the mariner and then um, his niece, uh, Lou Jane, struck me because of the way that they conceived of storytelling and education as a kind of weapon, a uh, kind of way of resisting. Um, for, for this family, as for many Palestinians, education is more than a mode of social advancement, though it is that as well. It is a means of keeping alive their personal and collective history and of resisting the settler colonial suppression of their culture and their way of life. Storytelling is a means of resistance and it flourishes where there is space for dissent and critique. Already back in 1980, Palestinian anthropologist Khalil Nakhle underscored the importance of storytelling to Palestinian resistance. Nakhle argued that the loss of Palestine in 1948 gave a special importance to education as a way of connecting Palestinians across diaspora and creating a space for political transformation. So Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish has also made this point in poetic terms in, in this quote here when he asks, and this is from one of his last works um, published in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2006, just a few years before he died, a couple of years, as we don't know the difference between a mosque and a university because they are both from the same root in Arabic, why do we need the state since states pass just as surely as time? Darwish pinpoints here the poetic as well as the spiritual affinity between the university and the mosque. What both institutions share in common and what, what makes them both spaces where free speech must flourish 
is their ability to question and sometimes to undermine worldly power. The central political importance, ah, the slide, ah. The central political importance of universities for the survival and flourishing of the Palestinian people is also borne out in the statistics in terms of the high liter literacy rate that Palestinians have relative to the Arab world and indeed the global population. According to the Palestinian, Palestine Census Bureau of Statistics, the literacy rate across the West Bank and Gaza was 96.9% in 2016. According to UNESCO data, the literacy rate increased in um, 2019, three years later, to 974 These numbers place Palestine well above Israel, which has a 92% literacy rate, according to the same UNESCO source. All of these details bring me back to the family in Gaza to whom I dedicate this lecture on free speech in Palestine and beyond. They inform my attempt to understand why the quest for freedom through acts of speech, including acts of protest, matters now amid the ongoing genocide of the people of Gaza. My connection with this family grounds this quest towards what I hope are the things that actually matter in the lives of a people who will never be satisfied with mere physical survival although survival obviously matters as well. The family has inspired me not only in my work on Palestine, but also in my own life, in my efforts to understand the place and potential of free speech in the flawed liberal democracies of the United Kingdom, where I work, and the United States, where I was born and raised, and to document how much we miss when we relegate the issue of free speech to a matter of mere balance that must be constrained by other equitable goals. The Palestinian struggle for freedom does not admit of compromise. So too, I will argue, uh, or I argue in general in, in other work on free speech, uh, free speech is a fundamental human right. Indeed, it is the fundamental human right. It is one of the true universals of human experience and best understood as an integral aspect of human freedom. So I will begin with the present, moving backwards in time. While it is impossible for us to adequately historicize the Gaza genocide because it is unfolding before our eyes, these events cannot be skipped over in any attempt to make sense of the role of free speech in the struggle for Palestinian liberation. Um, I will move backwards in time from the Gaza genocide to where, um, to, to, uh, to around the time of the UK's adoption of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, but that's where my book begins and uh, the discount code there is listed if you're interested in buying it. Um, the, event is, the, the event of the UK's adoption of the IHRA definition is significant because the UK was the first country in the world to adopt the IHRA definition um, and many of the crackdowns on protest in solidarity with Palestine that have taken place since have justified the suppression through this definition. The, and I think we see a kind of continuation of that, that trend that was put in place by this adoption um, in the, the recoding of terms like intifada and from the river to the sea as anti-Semitic. That's part of the same kind of rhetorical reframing um, a strategy that was pioneered by the IHRA definition as a means of rapidly altering the common sense understanding of terms through censorious acts of decontextualization. As I wrote in my book, the suppression of pro-Palestine speech in Europe and North America is inevitably intertwined with events on the ground in Palestine. The role played, uh, I wrote, by, by Israeli checkpoints in the realm of geopolitics is echoed in the realm of political debate by the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Both dictate what can and cannot be said, not according to what is right or wrong, but according to who is in power. In 24, 2024, of course, that point needs to be expanded beyond the matter of checkpoints, since what we are dealing with now is genocide. Um, so while the exercise of free speech within Western liberal democracies is often separated from the study of other forms of protest in authoritarian regimes, the violent crackdown on pro-Palestine activism in Western liberal democracies in recent months blurs these distinctions and compels us to see all protests and their suppression as part of a continuum with the struggle for free speech as their common denominator. So moving now to specific context within Palestine, specifically the West Bank. Um, this is a project that I, I sort of 
began, although I wouldn't say that I've gotten very far with it because it was intended to be focused on Gaza, uh, on, on, to have a large component of focus on Gaza as well as the West Bank, and I, I haven't been able to proceed with that. Um, but uh, so this, this was supposed to begin right as October 2023 happened. Um, one by one, the physical infrastructure of all of Gaza's universities were destroyed. I will not say that the universities themselves were destroyed because as we all know, a university is much more than the buildings in which it is housed. The universities of Gaza live on in the students and faculty who are alive and thirsty for knowledge. Some students have even managed to defend their MA theses from within the tents where they are sheltering while planning out their PhD education. This is one illustration of how universities are in fact surviving but in, in, in Gaza, but under radically different forms. Yet it is difficult to overstate the damage inflicted by Israel on the intellectual culture of Gaza the targeted nature of these attacks has gone beyond anything that has previously been seen in Palestine. A number of terms have been used in recent months to describe the specific targeting of Palestinian knowledge and cultural life. These include, uh, include scholasticide, as Adina mentioned, a term first coined by Oxford professor Carmen Ablusi during the 2008-2009 Israeli assault on Gaza. Now, Blusi uses the term to describe the destruction of Palestinian educational institutes, institutions that took place during that war. 15 years later, I would suggest uh, that an even wider ranging term, epistemicide, uh, more fully describes the present moment. Where scholasticide focuses on the destruction of education's physical infrastructure, Epistemicide describes the eradication of knowledge and the ability to preserve it. Epistemicides happen over the long durée, a case, um, particularly in Palestine. The term epistemicide, to my knowledge, was introduced by the Portuguese sociologist Boaventura de Sousa Santos to describe the colonial destruction of indigenous knowledge and has also been actively used by Puerto Rican cultural theorist Ramon Grossvogel. The term is broadly relevant to many settler colonial contexts. At the same time, of course, epistemicide and scholasticide merge, as we can see in a statement by scholars against the war in Palestine regarding the Gaza genocide, uh, that Israeli colonial policy in Gaza has now shifted from a focus on systematic destruction to total annihilation of education. So the purpose of the project, uh, Free Speech in Palestinian Universities, was to explore how free speech was defended and contested in Palestinian universities and to document in coordination with Palestinian colleagues the challenges that faculty and students who exercise their free speech rights face, both as a result of the Israeli occupation as well as through internal forces of suppression, including the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Among other goals, our aim was to compare pressures on academic freedom between Gaza and the West Bank, as well as with the wider academic world, and to understand what a specifically Palestinian approach to free speech might look like. We were interested to know how Palestinians push back against the suppression of their free speech, and whether their methods and tactics might be instructive beyond the Palestinian context, in particular for those of us in Europe and North America who are in solidarity with the Palestinian movement. Thus far in this research, uh, which is done in coordination with colleagues at Anaja University and very briefly before October 23 uh, with students at the Islamic University of Gaza, we gathered extensive evidence that Palestinian students and faculty have robust expectations for academic freedom, even when their institutions do not actively support them in this regard. They exercise their free speech rights in powerful ways, sometimes leading to substantial political change. The fact that universities specifically are targeted for destruction within Gaza and the raids to which they are subjected in the West Bank shows that they represent a threat to the Israeli occupation. When the, but I, as I'll discuss in, the, in these pages, um, these next few minutes, there's been a sense of pretty sharp transformation in the the scope for the expression of protest and dissent uh, since the first intifada in, in, in the West Bank in particular. When the first Palestinian intifada erupted in Gaza's Jabalia refugee camp in 1987, students across Palestinian universities were overwhelmingly mobilized for political action. As Rula Salame, who was a freshman at Birzeit University, 
uh, when the, in Ramallah, when the first intifada began, recalled, 150 university students slept for three nights in a row in a village near Tulkadam. The student council had arranged the trip to the village in order to assist a Palestinian family in collecting the olives from their olive tree grove. The students had to defy Israeli soldiers who were preventing the family from accessing their land during the olive harvest season. As Salami recalled 41 years later, the student group enabled the family to collect all of their olives without being attacked by their soldiers, by the Israeli soldiers, for the first time since a military zone had been set up near the land. Although the Palestinian movement remains key to political mobilization across Palestine, times have changed when it comes to their ability to mobilize politically. Omar Kiswani, the former president of the Student Council for Birzeit University, reported in 2018 on the reason for the decline in student mobilization, the Palestinian Authority and its security coordination with Israel. As he pointed out, students are regularly arrested and imprisoned for their political affiliations on campus. Kiswani himself was arrested for his participation in a Hamas-affiliated group on campus. Also at Birzeit University, the coordinator of the Right to Education campaign, Sondos Hamad, points to the overwhelming role of the Israeli occupation in suppressing the free speech of Palestinian students. Israel tries to destroy the youth by arresting them, imprisoning them, and by attacking especially the student council, Hamad adds. The Israeli occupation feels threatened by student leaders, by members of the student council, and by those who are our hope to change the status quo. In addition to concerns about being arrested and killed, West Bank Palestinians must also contend with threats to their livelihood, given the vast control Israel and Palis the Palestinian Authority exert over the Palestinian economy. On Palestinian university campuses, being political is a dangerous business. Although my evidence is anecdotal, I will add that one respondent in Gaza during the summer of 2023 suggested that to me that there were fewer restrictions on free speech in the universities of Gaza than the West Bank. As we are witnessing uh, across North American and European universities, uh, the exercise of free speech and academic freedom is met with suppression in the West Bank. Um, police regularly shut down student protest and there are also targeted assassinations. Palestinian professor and intellectual Nizar Banat, who is critical of the Palestinian Authority, was widely believed to be the victim of a targeted assassination in 2021. Palestinian writer and academic Ahmed Katamesh was imprisoned for nine years in Israeli prisons without ever being formally charged with a crime. And Abdel Sattar Qasim, a professor of political science at Anaja University, was repeatedly arrested and interrogated by the PA shortly prior to his death in 2021. Although the infrastructure for supporting political protest has been radically diminished compared to the time of the first intifada, the protests of, of Palestinian students has not abated, have not abated in intensity, but there is a sense of a lack of direction. The, uh, nonetheless, uh, these protests are an intrinsic feature of university life in Palestine. Neither students nor staff are willing to accept the status quo. So now I'm turning to European and North American context, which is also what, what my book focuses on. Um, while the story of the exercise of free speech for the purpose of protest and social transformation begins in the Palestinian context in 1987 with the first intifada, in the UK I would place the, the beginning of my story on 12 December 2016. This is the date on which, according to a press release by the UK government, entitled Government Leads the Way in Tackling Antisemitism, the UK adopted what, what at that point was not a household or widely known word. This is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of antisemitism. Although the caveat, quote, working definition has disappeared now from invocations of the term quite often, it is worth noting that when this definition was first introduced, it was consistently described as non-legally binding. We were assured on that basis that the definition could not possibly pose a threat to free speech because after all, it had no legal force. Back in 2018, I wrote an article challenging this legally non-binding claim in which I introduced the concept of a quasi-law to describe the legal impact of the so-called non-legally binding definition. 
I'm sorry to say that everyone back then who was warning of the dangers of the definition, and that the, the list is very long of very courageous uh, specialists in anti-Semitism who were warning of it, but uh, I, I just, in the interest of referencing people who are sort of nearby or integrated in SOAS, I would highlight the names of David Feldman at Birkbeck in, uh, University, who has done really incredible work critiquing the IHRA definition, and uh, Yair Wallach, also of SOAS, as well as Ken Stern, the lead drafter of the definition, uh, back when it had a different name and a much humbler purpose of assisting with data collection. All of these warnings were proven correct. Um, I first became aware of the definition and the danger it posed in 2017 when I was alerted by a Jewish colleague at the University of Bristol where I was teaching at the time. Um, a student had just published an op-ed in the student newspaper criticizing a short essay I had written while living in Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank in 2012, and this was in 2017 that the, the, I was at Bristol. My colleague warned me that he suspected that the op-ed was more than a simple criticism of my forgotten essay, which had been published years before I joined the University of Bristol or even before I had visited the UK. Surely enough, within a few months of that letter, a campaign was underway led by external organizations, including organizations that are named in my book, but I'm not naming in this talk, uh, to get me fired from my position. Although I was, in the end, I was not censored or punished in any way by the university, um, a process of an inquiry dragged on for several months, um, and the, the, the salient aspect of that inquiry is that the uh, IHRA definition was used in order to determine whether or not my article was anti-Semitic. I uh, have researched this quite a bit, and I believe that that is the first time that in any university, anywhere, actually, in the, uh, certainly in the UK, but probably anywhere in the world, that this definition had been used in that way um, to sort of uh, pose a litmus test on an academic's writing. Uh, back then, many still regarded the IHRA definition as a neutral tool for promoting awareness of anti-Semitism. Now, in 2024, the United States is posed to adopt legislation known as the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act that formally integrates the IHRA definition into federal law for the first time. And remember, this is the legally non-binding definition of anti-Semitism we're talking about. The IHRA definition has been included in the legislation of many US states for years, um, particularly relating to um, anti-boycott or anti-BDS laws. But this will be the first time that the IHRA definition will become legally binding in all respects across all of the United States. I believe that the legislation has not yet passed, but it, it will pass. It's passed um, the... Um, the, the legislature hasn't passed set the Senate yet, but it certainly will, and it is very much, the, the driving force behind it is very much about um, quashing campus protests for Palestine. Although in the UK we have not quite reached that moment, the direction of travel is clear, as is reflected in the Economic Activity of Public Bodies Overseas Matters Bill, which is currently making its way through the House of Lords. In different ways, both the US and the UK laws target free speech, the first by criminalizing any criticism of Israel that is deemed disproportionate, the second by banning peaceful movements to boycott Israel. Notably, the UK law also includes a specific prohibition on calling for boycott, so it also targets speech. Within five years of the UK government's adoption of the IHRA definition, the, the vast majority of UK universities had adopted the definition under government pressure. There were a few honorable exceptions, and I'm very happy to say that SOAS is one of those exceptions, one of the very few universities that resisted intense pressure to adopt the definition. Uh, other universities adopted the, the Jer Jerusalem Declaration of Antisemitism, which was created uh, by a group of Jewish scholars to, to counter the, the uh, toxic effect of the IHRA definition and a few universities adopted both. Um, but overall, the, the UK government, UK's government-run Office of Students reported in 2021 that over 200 UK universities had adopted the definition. The maintenance of such lists of, of who, who, which universities have and have not adopted this definition is part of an effort by the government to coerce universities 
into adopting the definition, notwithstanding the claim that it is legally non-binding. Other forms of pressure exerted by the government include the threat to withhold funding to universities that do not adopt this definition. In retrospect, these may seem like minor moments in the history of suppression of, of the suppression of pro-Palestine speech and activism in the UK and Europe. And just kind of from a, I'll just add also from a kind of autobiographical point of view, I think just the, the kind of, a lot of people sensed that this IHRA definition couldn't be that bad in the early stages. They didn't, it was just seemed too complicated. It was seen as something that, you know, there's no harm in adopting it. But I think several years later, we can see very long list of harms and a very, there's a very clear case that it has constrained the limits of pro-Palestine speech in the UK and around the world. Um, just as the Gaza genocide was preceded by many decades of what Mohammed Nijam writing in 2022, so just a year before this genocide, called a slow motion genocide, he was writing about Gaza and describing, making the case for genocide in Gaza in 2022. So too was the foundation for the current violent crackdown of pro-Palestine protest across North American and European university campuses laid many years ago with the push to compel universities to adopt the IHRA definition. So I guess the, the takeaway there is that the, the kind of the violence and brutality that are happening now, the seeds of that are, are actually in these seemingly very minor, even boring documents like the IHRA definition that people can kind of easily ignore because the threat is not very, very visible. But then you look back and you can see the beginnings of the repression in these types of, of documents. And now, eight years after the IHRA definition was first adopted by the UK and has since been adopted by many countries and institutions around the world, we are witnessing intense police brutality towards students and staff who have shown their solidarity with the Palestinians of Gaza by setting up encampments on university campuses. And again, I, like with D Dina, I would give a shout out to the SOAS encampment, which I just visited today. I'd encourage anyone to do that. Um, they're very impressed with, with the organization of the students, with their commitment and dedication, and actually their courage as well. Uh, the most recent figures indicate that over 3,000 students and staff have been arrested in the USA alone while participating in protests for Palestine. From Palestine to Europe to North America, students understand that universities are drivers of social transformation. Whether that transformation, and as, as an academic um, here's the hard part, uh, whether that transformation is progressive or rep repressive is shaped by protest, dissent, and other exercises of free speech. University tr universities train the next generation of leaders for good or for evil. They often determine the boundaries of what kinds of discourses can and cannot be regarded as legitimate, for in particularly, I would say, in relation to anti-Semitism. While universities do not always drive political change, they are the places where power is contested and consolidated. So I think many of you know these, these details and facts, but I didn't wanna, I, just to kind of document you know, the destruction of all the universities of Gaza, I'll just move, move over those, those slides. Um, uh, so in response to the widespread targeting of universities by Israeli forces, we must renew our focus on the work universities do in the Palestinian context, how they condition and shape Palestinians' political aspirations, and why they form a central part of the Palestinian freedom struggle. Universities are sites of hope and places where new possibilities are political possibilities, particularly political possibilities, I would repeat, are formed. Um, and in that light, I wanna highlight this initiative uh, from Bir Zeit University to provide access to online, online learning to students in Gaza whose educations have been cut short by genocide. And in terms of saying that, calling that political, the point is that it, it creates a community between the Palestinians of Gaza and the Palestinians of the West Bank, uh, and universities are the drivers of that. That is, that is a, it is in the service of education, as what, but it does have a huge political impact as well on the student population. What is the meaning of free speech and academic freedom when an entire university system is being destroyed? Not just universities, but the very possibility of education in the case of Gaza. However, the history of the long relationship between free speech and Palestinian liberation teaches us that even amid a genocide, the preservation of knowledge and the exercise of free speech is a central part of resistance. 
In this context, an exclusive focus on humanitarian rights alone, the right to eat and to live, which are obviously essential, um, in the absence of human rights, including education and free speech, would be dehumanizing. So again, back to my question, what is the point of free speech under conditions of genocide? What is the role of academic freedom within the broader struggle for free speech? As Palestinian scholar Esmat al Halabi has argued um, in, a, in an article that I would definitely recommend to everyone um, from in, published in the Baffler, it's called Towards an Intellectual History of Genocide in Gaza. He argues that genocide begins with the idea of genocide. And specifically in, uh, in his article, he outlines this, this idea um, in Israeli universities. This means that not just not just that spaces of intellectual inquiry often serve as incubators for ideologies that lead to genocide, but also that when genocide is perpetrated, it often targets spaces of learning first because these are the institutions that incubate the most effective and the longest lasting means of resistance. Epistemicide is a constitutive constitutive part of genocide. Fighting it through the exercise of free speech is an impactful way of resisting genocide. Epistemicide targets the conditions through which the Palestinian people can retain their history and cultural memory amid a century of ethnic cleansing and forced displacement. Epistemicide is a strategy for turning genocide into a permanent condition from which there can be no recovery, and it follows from that that the most effective means of resisting epistemicide is through education, which requires free speech. The intertwinement of epistemicide with other forms of genocide, forced starvation, many of which Dina just mentioned, do domicide, the destruction of homes, the destruction of hospitals, the targeting of doctors, and threats of extermination is, I would argue, one of the most distinctive features of the Gaza genocide. Um, so, and moving to a conclusion, I do want to remark that I, I didn't actually, I have to say, to be honest, I didn't really plan to write as much about universities as I am, but it just became inevitable. Uh, but, but one thing I did, haven't done is try to make a distinction between academic freedom and free speech, not in, in this context. Um, of course, it's a very important distinction, but I think it's, it's different from what I'm trying to say in this context. Academic freedom pertains to the rights and responsibilities that come with working and studying inside a university and the freedom of inquiry that university employers must grant their staff and students. But universities matter not just for those who work within a university, but for the free speech of an entire society, not just for, for its students and staff. Uh, here, I want to return to Mahmoud Darawish and to his very, I think, important and inspiring point about the affinity between the mosque and the university. And what, I'll, I'll go back to that quote. Thank you. The mosque and the university and what that alliance means uh, between the two means for the ruling power of the age, since states, as Darwish put it, pass just as surely as time. Even when universities are bombed to the ground, they don't pass, they don't fade or, fit or disappear in the way that states do, just as surely as time, and leaving ruins behind. They, they leave ruins behind. They leave their traces on human souls and on the souls of those who follow after them. Universities teach people how to be free. At the same time, I don't want to idealize the work of the university. As scholars of Israeli apartheid, such as Maya Wind in her new book, which I think was presented here uh, maybe a few weeks ago, um, called uh, Towers of Ivory and Steel, as well as Esmat al-Halabi and the, the article I mentioned, they've shown us that while sometimes universities do enlighten us, they also, to put it very bluntly, teach people how to commit genocide. Although the words I have quoted by Darwish offer one of the most suggestive theories of the role of education in Islamic political and cultural history, it is important to note that Darwish himself did not receive a university degree. He began studying at Lomonosov Moscow State University in 1970 on an academic course uh, under the in Soviet Union, uh, but he left after 11 months, disgusted by the corruption inside the Soviet system. And uh, one thing that I think was particularly galling for him was the demand that he collaborate with the Soviet regime and become an informant on his fellow writers. 
Darwish later explained uh, to his friend, Ziad Abdel Fattah, his reasons for leaving Moscow University so soon after he arrived. And so this is a quote of what Darwish said in the memoirs of his friend. I lost the bet on the usefulness of the struggle there. Uh, you, you probably don't know how disappointing it is when you see corruption gnawing at a system where you saw your salvation. So this too happens in universities, right? We know that. I think all of us know that very well. Uh, my point is not that universities are the salvation of humanity or that they will redeem us from our unfortunate pr propensity as a species for perpetuating genocide. Universities are embedded within the same structures of power that oppress all of humanity, but they are also repositories of hope, hope for the future, hope for the world, and hope for ourselves. And even if you don't buy what I just said, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to reference a point made by the African-American cultural theorist and university professor Robin D.G. Kelly when pressed on the role of universities in societies overwhelmingly structured by inequality. The, qu the point, uh, questioner was asking him, well, why should we really care about what happens in universities if we're really interested in social justice? There's obviously so much evil taking place outside universities. Kelly's response was that even if the, he, even though he wasn't going to insist that the university is more, fighting for universities is more worth, worth fighting for than any other social issue, what he was certain about was that the university is the place where these battles for justice are being waged, often covertly. Because they are embedded in existing structures of power, universities are the place, for better or worse, where our future worlds are forged. And this is why we can never give up on the struggle for free speech in a university context. Whatever we might happen to think about universities as spaces of exclusion, hierarchy, and injustice. Universities are the front lines where the battle is waged for the future of the Palestinian people and of all peoples over the long course of their histories. As Darwish intuited, the Arabic root uh, Jimim Ein, shared by both words mosque and university, confirms what mosques share in common with universities. Uh, they are, in a fundamental sense, created for the totality of a community, for everyone, not just for their employees or just the people who attend the mosque. Universities are and ought to be open spaces where battles that are waged covertly can be contested publicly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good over. Yeah, it's okay standing. So, um, can you hear us from here? If you bring Roberto,